This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the June 28th edition of the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal, back with you alongside the usual crew, starting in the DRF offices in Manhattan, in the shadow of the Chrysler Building, he is Mike Hogan. Mike, how are you doing today? Doing great, Pete. How about you? I'm well. I'm very well. And then we have, from the planet Texas, I think he's back in Texas anyway, world traveler that he is. Sometimes it's hard to keep track. He is last year's NHC Tour champion. He is Jonathan Kinchin. Jonathan, what's up? Yeah, I look forward to every Tuesday after having bad weekends of you introducing me as a 2015 tour champion. <laughs> <laughs> Helps me kind of get, help get going back in the right direction. Oh, that's great. Yes, I was not able to say the 2016 Gold Cup betting challenge winner, unfortunately, but I will ask because I have you here. What happened to you out there? Um, no, I Nothing really. It's just one of those deals when – the way the races are carded and when the races run and your opinions run, uh, you know, it, it's when that the good stuff happens. I mean, I hit a big pick three to end the day, but I was out in the tournament. So it, it just it just matters where your opinion lands and, and if you have money left for it. It's been one of the biggest things that, that my group of tournament friends have always talked about is how do you handle a situation when your strongest opinion is extremely late in the tournament? Um, is it enough for you to float and have your – your, your starting bankroll to, to bet on that horse, or do you feel as if you want to take some other opportunities along the way to grow a bigger bankroll um, so that you can take a shot? And, and, you know, I've done it both ways, and both ways have worked, and both ways have backfired, so uh, that's part of the magic. Do you think it was a money management issue this time? I mean, had you, should you have waited longer? I mean, these weren't exactly scintillating uh, betting cards, especially on day two, um, or do you feel like it just didn't work out this time? No, I just didn't work out. I mean, every time you look back, and, and I should probably do it more in depth just to kind of have a, a feel for what happens. But I mean, I ran second. I ran second in a in a in a five hundred dollar double that would have that would have put me on the lead on day one. So, you know, it's, it's you know, what do you do in those situations? It just happens, and I don't think it's money management. I think it's just you know, you just need to get a l- little bit lucky here or there, and maybe some better decision making along the way. But but nothing nothing outrageous, and nothing you know, it's not. Not nearly the, the the disasters that I have had in the past. It was just a, you know, just couldn't. <laughs> Having looked over your shoulder, I agree. I don't think it was a man- money management problem. I think the way this tournament shook out, it made a lot of sense to be more aggressive on day one, given that the the racing, especially towards the end of the day, and we'll be talking about those races later. In fact, as a special treat, the second half of the show, we're going to bring in race caller Michael Rona to add his two cents about all the big action out at Santa Anita this weekend. But, yeah, I think I would have leaned heavily on day one. The older, the overall winner of the tournament was a guy whose name I've been seeing on leaderboards for years, Los Angeles resident, a pediatrician from what I understand, a guy named Hesham Ragab. By all accounts, a super nice guy for whatever reason, decided he didn't want to talk to me for my article, but that's okay. Uh, I got some great stuff from Bob Trainer, who ran second. Trainer, of course, the 2014 Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge winner. He was joking with me about the possibilities of being a one-hit wonder. He proved that that was not, in fact, the case, and he will be heading back to the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge, and he's always a player to watch, a guy who really fires. As for the doc, didn't give me a proper interview, but in the five minutes he spoke with me, he did mention the fact that he went to Harvard. So he did live up to that cultural stereotype of the Harvard folks always letting you know that within, say, five minutes of conversation. So anyway, we'll follow him. He's got a shot at a million bucks now at the BCBC. And uh, one of those storylines that will be interesting to follow, Vic Stauffer, another with a shot at the million-dollar bonus. We'll add another name to that list in October. Hopefully we're going to start running some qualifying tournaments soon for the October betting challenge at Santa Anita. I think that's October 8th and 9th. And perhaps the third person with a shot at the million will be our very own Jonathan Kinchin. Jonathan, how big of a factor for you was the million dollars in the way that you approach this tournament? Well, it's not a it's not a big deal at all for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a big deal, but it's not it doesn't influence my decision making. Like I you know, Nate had me do, uh, Nate Newby had me do, like, a little video for their simulcast feed, and, and, and what I said on there is that, like, it's kind of like going to your favorite restaurant 
and and then finding out that someone else picked up the tab. It's like it doesn't matter. You were gonna go anyways, and like you were gonna be excited about going. But it's like, oh, and by the way, if you win the tournament, then you get a million dollar bonus. Like that's great. I was gonna go to all the Santa Anita tournaments anyway, so it's not gonna influence my decision. But I think it's amazing that they did it. I think it's um, I think it's smart. I think it's forward thinking. Um, and I and I commend those guys for for always trying to see what they can do to make the horse players experience a little bit better. But how about this? We noticed lately in the Santa Anita tournaments, maybe the score is not being as high as they had been in the past. Here this time around, we had three people, despite two, you know, obviously the big races were the big races, but other than that, sort of average days of racing at best, and yet we had the top three players landing all with 20,000 bucks. It made me wonder, I mean, let me ask you, Mike Hogan, if you had a chance to win, uh, potentially uh, put yourself in a position to win a million bucks, is that going to make you more aggressive as a horse player? Oh boy, um, I you know I don't know if that's going to be in the forefront of my mind. I'm I'm kind of with Jonathan. You know, you, you're thinking about winning the tournament. You're not thinking about, you know. I mean, it's it's one thing to think three chess moves, ten chess moves ahead. That's like thinking fifty chess moves ahead. That's uh, what four months away. You know, a, a, a series of races that not only don't have horses carded yet, but uh, you don't you don't even know what you know, any opinions of, of any of those, you're focused winning that, you know, I think that's going to be the, the main focus of my mind. Everything else is just gravy. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, it could, yeah, what do you think, Jonathan? Do you think well, those high I, scores were correlated to the outsized reward for first place? No, I actually think the scores were high because people were, I, I think a couple things. One, I think that people were um, were aggressive on day one because of the, 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 the type of card that was carded for Sunday. If you didn't look at Sunday, it was a lot of short fields. Santa Anita's in a tough spot right now, not having the turf course. Um, and so it, they only have so many horses that can fill these dirt races, so on and so forth. So the, the fields were a little bit smaller. Uh, one of them had one to five sensitively, who oddly enough was beaten in it. So I think a lot of people were aggressive, and so the bankrolls were a little bit a little bit higher on Saturday than they typically are on a you know on the first day. And then on Sunday, I think what happened was people did something they don't normally do, which was they were allowed to be aggressive in betting likely scenarios to happen: thousand um, dollar exactas, thousand dollar doubles, you know, two thousand a win, three thousand a win. They were allowed to be more aggressive than they normally would. When they're betting hundreds of dollars on 15 and 20 to 1 shots, they were betting thousands of dollars on more likely winners, and I think that influenced how it kind of got as high as it did. Very, very interesting observations from both of you guys. I have to just make a note about where I'm doing the podcast from today. I'm actually in my childhood home on Long Island, and I'm in the basement of that childhood home to try to get a little bit of a, of a noise-free zone. And... Uh, it just so happens I just stumbled upon a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of Maker's Mark whiskey. At the, if you ever go to the distillery of Maker's Mark in Loretto, Kentucky, and they're not a sponsor of this podcast, not yet anyway, but if you go to that uh, distillery, you can hand dip your own bottle of Maker's Mark. And I have just found a bottle of Maker's Mark that I hand dipped on April 30th, 1999, and then I wrote a little note on the side of the bottle, Oaks Day. <laughs> Just kind of weird. That would have been my second Kentucky Derby back in the streak when uh, my wife Susan, not wife at that point, but uh, girlfriend, then wife Susan, were going, the, were going to the Derby every year. I have to admit, it makes me a little bit nostalgic and think, gosh, should I, should I break this streak of not going to the Derby and actually make it a point to get back there next year? Jonathan, I'll ask you. You go every year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that if, if, you know, if, if I have, if I'm breathing, I'm going. So I, I've already told people, don't get married, don't have kids. Um, my son better not graduate. I mean, it, you know, it's, I'm not going to miss it. So, um, I would recommend that if you can go, go. It's, uh, it's my favorite two days in, in sports for sure. Reminds me of advice I once heard from an Alabama football fan that he gave to his family. He said, y'all can get married or die, just don't do it on game day. 
basically sums up your attitude. Let's talk about a little bit of racing here. Uh, we'll start out just quickly out at Santa Anita. We'll get into those races a little bit more later in the show when Michael Rona joins us. But, uh, Jonathan, what were your general thoughts on uh, – we'll start with the triple bend. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I constantly say that I'm not a – I'm not a, a jockey basher, but sometimes I feel like I'm, jo I'm bashing jockeys. I thought that uh, Kobe's back got a terrible ride, um, yeah. and, uh, and 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 I, I thought that that cost him the race. I mean, the, the track seemed to be pretty inside speed favoring, and Kobe's back moved early into a into a moderate pace, you know, wide. I just thought it was ridiculous, and, and it was funny, Pete. We talked because I, I talked to Mike the night before you guys did the podcast on Friday. I was traveling. Mike texted me and said, uh, you know, he was ready to attack me that I was going to pick Subtle Indian. And then I texted him back, no, Kobe's back is going to win for fun. And then I actually re-handicapped the race, and then we talked, and I actually thought Subtle Indian was going to be loose on the lead. I thought there was no other speed. I know the horse looks like he wants to go six, but I thought the stretch to seven would help. And he, uh, he actually ran pretty good. He wasn't good enough. Lord Nelson uh, nailed him at the wire, but... Um, I thought Kobe's back was probably best that day, and, and unfortunately didn't get the uh, the best ride. I've I've heard that the four go is next for him, so that'll be great to see him out in uh, in New York. And uh, I would imagine you would probably see someone else other than Gary, not just because of the ride, but also because they're going to be in New York. Let me ask you this, Jonathan: What was the correct, in your mind, strategy there? If you're if you're Stevens, I mean, not just to play devil's advocate. And I know there are some people who've defended the ride, including. Our buddy Matt Bernier, who we got to hang out with uh, over the weekend out there, was, which was fun to get a chance to catch up with him a little bit. And I was actually a guest on his show on Friday, which was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, his point was, well, you know, at that point it was obvious that no pace was going to materialize, and he felt like it was a now or never thing, and, and uh, the horse wanted to go, so, so he went. What would your alternative strategy have been? Well, I, I think it's fair to point out that I've never been on a horseback before. I think maybe one time when I was like seven in in Puerto Vallada, like on the beach, and that was probably it. So that let's say that first. Um, no, I think that my situation there is that as a Hall of Fame rider, I would like to think or hope that he's aware that there's some type of bias going on. And and the idea that there's a little bit of an inside speed bias, I would have rather him stayed inside a little bit longer, waited and, and made one run. Um, if he felt as if he needed to move on the turn wide, I'm fine with that. It's the aggressiveness and the and the timing of the move is what, what my problem was. I thought he just moved way too early, wide, and and was was inevitable to do what ha to hang like he did because the, you know he made he, it was just too tough of a, of a of a move for him. So, um, like I said, I wasn't out there. I just would have preferred he either saved the run for a little bit later or saved a little bit more ground on the turn. The horse always finishes, so um, that, that would have been the, probably the only thing I would have done differently. Mike, how do you evaluate Kobe's back coming out of that race for his next start potentially in the forego? Well, I mean, let's be honest here. Kobe's back is by far the best horse in that race. Simple as that. Uh, he's, he's better than every other horse in that race, hands down. However, if you break slow, if you go huge middle move where you go five, six wide on the turn and lose a bunch of ground and do it against a somewhat tepid pace, at least for the, uh, the class level, okay? Maybe two of those things can happen. All three of those things cannot happen in a grade one race, no matter whether you're the best horse or not. And that's what happened on Saturday with Kobe's back. I mean, look, he still got beat, what? Uh, two lengths, you know, um, after doing all that, it was a, a, a disaster race for the horse, uh, and he still ran huge. So if he gets a better setup, if he doesn't walk out of the gate again, which I know he does pretty much every race, but every every now and then he doesn't, uh, and if he doesn't lose, I think he went 43 feet further than Subtle Indian did in the race and 30-something feet further than Lord Nelson did, you know, if, if those things don't happen, he's the winner next time. But that's part of the problem with a horse that always breaks slow, is going to have to find a trip, and is a little bit pace compromised. Yeah, I don't really, I think at this point, I, I don't even think, I don't even consider the slightly slow break a negative. I, I don't know that that's the issue. I think you're, you guys hit it on the money, though, with your other, with your other critiques. 
And uh, it, it's tough. The, the earlier you make that move on the turn, the wider you're going to go. And at the end of the race, those trackist figures you cited might equate to whatever, three and a half and four lengths of, of, uh, of ground loss. He's always going to lose a little bit of ground, but you factor that in with the uneven distribution of the energy, and, and, and all of a sudden you get a recipe for some frustrated betters. Now, we've talked about this race for a few minutes and, and haven't, even, uh, haven't even mentioned the winner. I feel a little bit uh, remiss in that. Mike, what were your thoughts? Uh, you know, Lord Nelson's a good horse. Um, you know, he's been competing in graded stakes. He's been running well. He's been, you know, running decently against uh, horses like Run Happy. And, uh, you know, it was his first grade one win. And, and strangely enough, believe it or not, it was the first grade one win in 2016 for um, his trainer, who's, um, who's a little guy named Bob Baffert. So uh, it was a good run. He's a good horse. Um, he'll probably win a number of, of races going forward. I don't think he's one of the best sprinters in the country, or, or, or if he's going to be, he's going to have to improve a little bit. Between, the, between those two, the, the top two finishers, Jonathan, who, who do you want coming out of the race? Um, well, I think coming out of the race, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want Subtle Indian just because, um, you know, I think that if we're talking about what's the biggest events we still have left for the year, uh, I would think the Breeders' Cup Sprint is one of them, and, and I think that's going to hit Subtle Indian right in between the eyes going six furlongs. Um, I think six is too short for horses like Kobe's back, um, maybe even Lord Nelson. So um, I would want Subtle Indian moving out of that. Um, however, I did think Lord Nelson ran really well, and uh, we were all tipped off to that. Um, I, I wasn't on the show Friday, so I didn't have a chance to talk about it, but there was a horse that had outworked um, Lord Nelson that ran earlier on the card West Fest and I was looking forward to betting and I got cold feet and didn't bet nearly what I was planning on betting so that was kind of a hint that Lord Nelson was going to run well when West Fest kind of came back and proved that he was actually a pretty good horse. Where had you seen that information Jonathan about the about the work in one of the reports or was it yeah, something more the, anecdotal yeah, than that? No no it was the it was just a, one of the the California the Southern California workout reports um you know like I said it's it's the same information you can get if you're following the East Coast with Mike Welsh and, and, and Veshi, what they do out in, in New York, you know, uh, this is not a red board, this is just pointing out something from them, but like, you know, that, that horse that Chad had that ran really well that was uh, working with Flincher, um, Money Multiplier, I think was his name, that was a similar, yeah. similar situation where if you read those workout reports, you can often find horses that are working together, and that can be an indication of what their performances are going to be moving forward. I will accept redboarding on the show in two instances and two instances only, though they are somewhat far-reaching. One is if you're giving information that's going to help a listener in the future. The other is in an instance where you're plugging a daily racing form product because, you know, hey, that's kind of why we're here in a sense too. Jonathan, you hit both of those, uh, but you hit the bullseye with both of them there. So you're, you're, you're allowed. It's okay. I'm not going to cut you off. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, why don't we move on to Saturday's featured race at Santa Anita. It was the Gold Cup, um, perhaps not, uh, as we, we were saying, going in a, a, a vintage running, but a pretty interesting horse race all in all, and was won by a horse whose, uh, whose resume is starting to look pretty good in melatonin. Jonathan, we'll start with you with your general review of the Gold Cup. Um, yeah, good for him. Uh, he's a horse I'll be betting against in every opportunity moving forward. I, I get that he's run well. Um, I don't like to knock <clears throat> horses and sports teams for a who do they beat, but it, it's, a, it's a thing that you really do have to consider and, 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 and look at. Um, Pete and I were lucky enough to do uh, a little, little piece with Mike Smith uh, and Matt Bernier before the race that we did for the Breeders' Cup. And uh, Matt, I mean, not Matt, excuse me, Mike pretty much said that Opportunity was going to be a short horse. Like, I mean, he, he said that the horse needed, he was a work away. Bob said he was a work away, but they're going to go ahead and run him. And I would imagine that they ran him because of the, uh, the degree of difficulty that the Gold Cup presented. And I thought that he ran huge into a slow pace. And I'm going to go ahead and, and pay my year's membership for the Opportunity Fan Club and I will be betting him in every mile and a quarter race that he runs in for the rest of the year, whether California Chrome, Beholder, Songbird, or Frosted are in the race, um, because I think that at some point he's going to get it done, and he's going to be a huge price, and, and uh, I wouldn't let myself down uh, if, if I missed out on that opportunity. 
Two quick things on that interview with Mike Smith before we get to Mike's thoughts on the Gold Cup. The first is, if you are a vibe reader, like I know Jonathan is and I know I am, go back and watch this, um, this interview. It's on Facebook, I think. If you go to the Breeders' Cup Facebook page and scroll back, you'll be able to, you'll be able to find it. I think it's as good of an example of like coded speak of a jockey you'll ever hear. Not that, and, and when I say coded, I don't mean to apply there's anything like funny going on. It's just you could tell from everything Mike was saying that the, to me, as an experienced reader of jockey speak, exactly what Jonathan said, that this horse was going to, you could leave him, you might not, you might have to leave him in for a second, but I, I thought based on Mike's comments, you could really leave him off the top of the ticket, unless you thought there was going to be some sort of extreme pace scenario that was going to bring his stamina into play, which didn't seem logical given the, the construction of the race. So that's one thing. But my favorite part of the interview is the look on Mike Smith's face when Jonathan picks imperative for the Gold Cup, basically implying that his angle was Mike Smith off. <laughs> I, I, I said it, and I was like, I was like, no, 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 Mike, you don't understand. Like, you're on my Twitter picture. Like, I, I'm, I have an absolute crush on you. It's not that at all. I swear. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I, I tried to clean it up as much as I could. If you watch it, I, I got a little shaky trying to clear it up, but. You know, oh, it was great. It made that. for good. Made for good TV. Bernier comes after me. Comes to me afterwards. I was like, "Wow, you were a little like uh, hard on Johnson there." I was like, "No, nah, you don't understand. Listen to the podcast sometime." I was easy on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, well, I'm gonna have to dig to that you. one up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you gotta watch. It's good. Um, <laughs> go ahead, Mike, and let us know what your thoughts were on uh, Melatonin's triumph out there at the Great Race Place. First, before I say that, I have to go back to some of the, something that Jonathan said when he said, "Looking forward to um, betting opportunity in any mile and a quarter race," and he didn't want to miss out on the opportunity. You missed out on a chance for a really good pun there, Jonathan. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, I should have done it. I, I, done it. I, I felt like I, I used all of my puns when obviously ran, and so I felt like <laughs> I should skip that. The okay, fair enough. Messy, in other words. Fair enough. Um, I, I, I will. I will. St generally, I'm going to agree with Jonathan here, and I'm going to say Melatonin is a very good racehorse and has become a top class router. Who knew? Um, and he's the kind of horse that just lays down 24s, regardless of whether he's on the lead, regardless of whether he's stocking the pace. Uh, it was essentially a relatively slow pace where Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, carved out moderate fractions before spitting the bit, and, and after that, um, it was essentially a carousel. I agree that Hopportunity ran huge. His um, final uh, three quarters were fat. Each one of them were faster than every other uh, horse in the race. Uh, he was moving late against a slow pace. Uh, that said, I mean, he, he still was facing melatonin, win the space, hard aces, imperative, uh, you know, and, and a decent turf horse who uh, I thought maybe had a chance against a field like that, but turns out he's really just a turf horse. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the real horses show up in Southern California, when you get California Chrome, when you get Beholder, when Dortmund comes back, when Firing Line comes back. Melatonin's going to be fifth choice, at least, in my estimation. Uh, and maybe he'll be bet a little more heavily than that because of the strength of these races, but... Uh, He's at least the fifth best horse. He, he might even, from what Jonathan said, I might even agree that you, you rank him below opportunity, all things being equal. I'm, I'm going to take issue a little bit just with, that, just with the idea. Like for me, as a handicapper, I just put, place too much of an importance on current form that I'd put him fifth in that lineup. I mean, for me, he's probably, you know, you got to figure not all those horses are going to show up in the same spot. And even if he did, I mean, I'd be, I, yeah, I'd be afraid of, of Chrome and, and Beholder for sure, but uh, some of the others in that list, like, let's see what's left there, as opposed to a horse who's been thriving and won the two biggest races on the circuit and not with unimpressive speed figures and has kind of a push-button early presser style, too, that I think could make him a little bit of a threat going forward. I hope the public is thinking what Mike's thinking, is if you can get a price on this horse, David Hoffman's really good trainer. He's shown over the years. He knows what to do when he has a good horse. 
and I, and I think he's got one in in melatonin. Um, uh, what do you think, I Jonathan? Think, no, I, I think that you know he's one of those horses, kind of like who was it last week we talked about, uh, King Creesa, right? It's one of those situations where he has the same style as horses that are so much better than him that he's going to be asked to run harder, earlier, sooner than he ever has before facing Beholder and California Chrome. I think that it's going to gut him and set it up for horses to come off the pace, and those two horses are more likely to stay on. I just don't see him uh, getting you know, the trips against the types of horses he's been getting um, moving forward in the Pacific Classic or uh, even coming back in the awesome again leading up to Breeders' Cup. It's a fair point, uh, and I do think that the way that the race tripped out for him was definitely one of the reasons to, to like him going in. Mike, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my, my assessment earlier is, is certainly based on the assumption that Dortmund and Firing Line come back to be the same kinds of horse, if not better at four than what we saw last year. I mean, I'm assuming uh, each of those is arguably, at least last year, at their best, they were arguably as good as what we saw from Frosted. If we get even close to the four-year-old improvement that we saw from Frosted from either or both of those, uh, give me either of those over melatonin any day. Yeah, and, I just and, don't and, think, oh, you go ahead, Jonathan, but then I have a point to make just about like three-year-old versus four when you're talking about the triple crown horses, but you, you, I say that out loud so I'll remember. You go first, Jonathan. <laughs> Yeah, no, mine's really simple. I'm just saying, you know, and this horse, Arrogant, looks like he might be one that could come onto the scene and be kind of interesting, or or, or whatever the horse's name, uh, not Arrogant. Arrogate. 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 Yeah, that's, I mean, he got, he got yeah, a triple he looked figure, good. didn't he? 102, yep. Yeah, well, and, 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 and whatever happened to a horse like Smooth Roller, who uh, I think we all talked up as a potential for the Preachers' Cup Classic, he, he didn't make that, and I don't, I don't know if he's even worked since then. I don't even know if he's in training, if he's yeah, been retired. You know, I don't think but, you're going to see him anytime soon. You never know. I mean, he's a gelding, so uh, assuming he's he's ready to race, that that's the kind of horse that had some talent. And um, you know, a anyway, I'm just saying there are other horses that are likely and very possibly going to step up. Look, don't get me wrong. Melatonin is very great, a good horse. I'd love to own him, um, but most likely, I think he's vulnerable in the bigger races going forward. My point about the three-year-old versus four-year-old thing, if you're talking about a horse who is handled patiently by like an old-school horseman, I'm all about the big improvements you see between three and four and four and five. But we've seen year after year the horses that go through the grind of the Triple Crown, they sometimes don't come back at all, frequently don't come back at all for a combination of economic and uh, and physical reasons. I just don't think you can expect those horses to have that normal development curve. And for me, I would take a horse with uh, 2016 form, like way before I'd be in a hurry to take one of those horses, assuming that they'd be even 75% as good as they were at three. But I mean, but it could be wrong, and we'll see. I mean, I'd love to be proven wrong, and I'd love to see Dortmund. Um, continue to deliver on some of that potential that he's shown us through his through his career. Firing line, I think I'm even more cynical, just because, I mean, when was the last time he raced? Preakness. Oh, yeah, sir. exactly. I mean, how many horses run in the Preakness yeah. and then come back in June of their four-year-old year and are still good? There, there aren't. No, you know, not a long list. Calculator had a similar layoff, uh, and he's come back to be all right. I'm, I'm not saying it's... it's uh, the most likely scenario, but uh, I'm just excited to see both of them return. Word is that they're both working and, and likely to return soon. So I just think last year's three-year-olds were a very, very good crop. Uh, I'm excited to see what they can do as four-year-olds, and um, hopefully soon we'll get a chance. Calculator is a good example of a horse who who, uh, who who fits the bill of what of your modal model model modal is that a word model of <laughs> man modal is yeah. Post mine. Let's talk just very quickly uh, production meeting in the middle of the show style about the Ohio Derby before we let Jonathan go. Uh, finally, we see what Mo Tom can do with a smooth trip. I haven't had a chance to look up the buyer. If Mike doesn't know it off the top of his head, I'll give him a chance to look that up while I ask Jonathan. What he thought of the Ohio Derby? Were you even watching, or were you, were you, were you too stuck into the contest? <laughs> I was stuck into the contest. I stood up because everyone was standing around the TV. I didn't even see the break, and I was like, "Is that Mo Tom running down the middle of the track?" I didn't really handicap the race. Um, here's what I will say: is that 
you know, whenever you see these horses that have had some derby trail success and then they come back after the, the Triple Crown and they start kind of picking off some of these, you know, lower level derby races that Asbison and Baffert have done in the past, it doesn't really catch my attention very much. Let's see what happens when Mo Tom gets into, into races back with the big boys like the Haskell and the Jim Dandies and the Travers and, and we'll see how he is there. Good for him and good for the connections uh, to get a win from that horse. I know it was probably a really frustrating spring uh, with some of the trips that he's had. So it's always good to see that happening. But, uh, um, yeah, you know, I, I didn't think much of it other than, you know, good for him for, for getting a race, getting a race one. Mike, were you any more impressed with Mo Tom? Um, maybe slightly, you know, I mean, I think he's a good horse and I think he, um, you know, he certainly got his trip. He got a 95 buyer. Um, the field wasn't really the strongest. I, I think that's pa partly why we were making a case, uh, or at least I was making a case for a horse like Wild About Deb, who, who seemingly didn't do really any running at all. Got um, fed off the board. Yeah, so your, yeah, no. Your podcast you, theme is strong, Mike. That I, I guess so. I guess so. It wasn't it wasn't a cent of my own money, but um, uh, yeah, it was way too short at two to one. Um, but uh, you know, it was a, it was an okay field. It wasn't uh, you know Adventist and Discreet Lover, or certainly not Nyquist and Exaggerator, or even Gunrutter for that matter. Um, I, I'm so I, I like him. I, I think he could. We could see more good things from him going forward. I'm a little more optimistic than Jonathan, um, but I also do feel like he needs to back it up against uh, at least graded stake. I mean, it was a 500,000 non-graded stake um, that that kind of drew a, a, a field that you know along was what Baffert's decorated soldier was what the third or fourth, fifth string of his three-year-olds. Um, so. Uh, do it again at a short price, and then we can talk. That's so funny. I, I was going to say in my head that Decorated Soldier was a Pletcher. That's a Baffert? Oh, sorry. You're right. Yeah, Pletcher. You're absolutely okay. right. Pletcher. The, you're always I, right I, about those things, and I'm always wrong, so I just assumed <laughs> that was the case this time, but I actually got one right. For me, Adventist, I mean, that's a slow figure, and we've talked often about you know the, the, the no trips and slow races thing. But Adventist, and I only watched the race once, and it was you know not exactly HD. But um, it looked to me like he had a bit of a trip. He's always been a horse I'm expecting to be sort of a late developing Travers type. He's one I would give a look back, you know, maybe not going to be good enough to win the Travers, depending on who comes in, but maybe a horse who can hit the board at a very big number. I'm keeping him on the radar, um, and, and I do want to I want to spend some time watching that trip again. One other note about Mo Tom. This one, it's sort of a tangent because, uh, of course, his trainer, Tom Amos, good friends with Brent Sumja. Brent Sumja has not gone, and we talked about this when he was on the show, he hasn't been to Saratoga in something like 20 years since he was a, a, a horse trainer. It was a 95-degree day. They made him wear like a sport coat and tie. He hated it, and he vowed he was never going back. Apparently, Brent Sumja is breaking that vow as an opportunity to cash in on the bet that we had in the Triple Crown season. I'm trying to remember the specifics of it. I think each one of us picked a horse and it was a question of whoever's horse finished last was going to have to buy dinner in Saratoga. At the time, I thought Brent was just messing around, thinking he'd never go. He's actually going to show up, Jonathan, because you owe the man dinner. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's what I heard. That's what I heard. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find somewhere cheap to get in for the night. I might. You know where I'll probably take you guys to dinner? Is I'll probably take you to Shake Shack. <laughs> well, right you know, at the race course. Hey, if if I make it, all I can say is I can eat a lot of concretes. I don't yeah. look like it, but I can eat a lot of concretes. Right, we'll just go back, get in and out. You know, I no did look over right his. Now. I looked over his uh, his shoulder the other day at, at his Google search, and he was looking for most expensive restaurant in Saratoga. So I think you guys have kind of different ideas. We'll have to figure out the right way to, to choose a venue for that. All right, Jonathan, we've taken up enough of your time for today. We are going to let you go, and we're going to bring in our next guest. Our next guest we've been meaning to have on the show for a while, and I'm very happy that he's here with us now. He is the new race caller at Santa Anita, but he's hardly new to race calling. He's called races all around the world, including some historic calls, for example, 
Cigar's 16th consecutive win at the Arlington Citation Challenge back in the day. He's called three Santanita Gold Cups now, I believe. He's also, as far as I know, the only race caller to ever appear in voice, anyway, on Seinfeld. He is Michael Rona. Michael, how are you today? <laughs> I'm very well. Great to be with you. <laughs> Excellent. We're going to let uh, Mike Hogan, who's here with us as well, is going to start off by asking you a question, and we'll go we'll go back and forth and, and chat for a little bit. Sounds great. Mike, <clears throat> Michael, uh, glad to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Um, one of the things we like to ask people the first time they've been on our podcast is uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in racing and how you got uh, interested in racing and, and maybe how you became a fan in the first place and then, and then how that led into uh, uh, a job where you get to call races on a daily basis. Well, I didn't really have any family background in horse racing, and I think I was bitten by the racing bug around about the time I started high school, and racing is extremely popular in Australia. There's a vast radio simulcast network whereby you can listen round the clock to races being broadcast from around the country, and so I was exposed to a lot of race callers, and, and as I became a fan of horse racing, I also just found myself mimicking and wanting to emulate the race callers that I heard. Uh, really, it took a shine to it, and there was one particular race caller in Sydney named of Johnny Tapp, who uh, really fired my imagination, and uh, my grandfather had bought me a horse racing board game with plastic horses, play money, you move <laughs> them around the track to the roll of the dice, and I was fooling around with that, but decided I gained the most enjoyment by abandoning the normal rules and just calling out the horses' names as I pushed them around to the roll of the dice. And that was actually my first attempt at race calling. I still remember the names of those 10 plastic horses from that board game, but the, the dice was holding me back. It was interfering with the flow of the call. So my, my next step was to, was to draw the colours, the, the racing tilts of horses of that era, and the little pieces of paper, probably about an inch by an inch and a half, and I would line them up, push them across my bedroom floor. They'd probably only travel a couple of feet during the course of a race, and most of it was just <laughs> me inventing things, but I would call these races into a tape recorder at the top of my lungs, probably driving the neighbours crazy. And, uh, but I accumulated more than a thousand of these pieces of paper. I had them in little... Uh, brown paper lunch bags, and uh, they'd be labelled if I wanted to call a, a Melbourne staying race, I'd uh, grab a handful from that bag, or a, a Brisbane sprint race uh, likewise, and, and I, I did that for a couple of years, and was absolutely set on being a race caller by my early to mid-teens, before I ever went to the track and tried the real thing into a, into a tape recorder, you know, I, I was just absolutely adamant that this is what I wanted to do. That's amazing. Wow, that's you talked about you talked about the importance of, or you mentioned uh, having a race caller in particular that you admire. I wonder how important is it for a race caller to end up having a mentor to not only help you improve, but to also lead to those big opportunities. In your case, uh, coming to the United States to call races. Yes. Well, in the case of Johnny Tapp, he, he was my idol when I was in high school. Other kids were idolizing athletes, uh, uh, rock stars. I just wanted to be like Johnny Tapp. But I didn't have any communication with him. He was in Sydney. I was in Brisbane. And it was actually some local Brisbane race callers whom I contacted, and they invited me out to the track to, to practice. And a couple of them were very key in my development. They were extremely helpful. And um, I, I didn't even realize that, that, that Johnny Tapp was aware of me but he was offered the Hollywood Park job in 1990 and declined except to come over for a working vacation with his family. Uh, by his own admission, he was a bit long in the tooth to make a move of that magnitude. He was well regarded as, or widely regarded as the best caller in the country. And um, so they asked him, Hollywood Park asked him if there was some younger person with fewer commitments who could accompany him to Hollywood Park with a view to finishing off the, their season. This was in 1990. And he called me in Brisbane 
uh, when I didn't even really, I'd never met him, I'd never spoken to him. And I, I got this phone call from my idol, uh, and I was 24 by that stage, and reasonably happy with how my career was progressing, but just in, in little opportunities around Brisbane. Not, uh, I was not a high profile caller nationally by any stretch of the imagination. But about a month or six weeks after I got the phone call from John, I was at Sydney Airport ready to board a jumbo jet to California with him and his family. And it was a life changing and career changing moment. So it turns out that my idol, the, the man who inspired me the most to be a race caller, was the catalyst for my coming to the US. Absolutely remarkable. And 26 years later, I still pinch myself when I try to even contemplate. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So uh, tell us a little bit about what it's like. You know, you spent obviously a long time up in Northern California. Now that you're calling races down in Southern California uh, and ready to call uh, in a few months your first Breeders' Cup, um, what is it like preparing for those kinds of races and, and, and how do you, um, you know, or do you do anything different from calling your, your regular garden variety maiden claimer, maiden special weight, lower level claimers? Well, I do a lot of reading. Of, I try to uh, gain as much background to, to each horse um, as, as possible, but the, the Breeders' Cup's going to take everything to a new level for me. It's going to be... Uh, an incredible experience and uh, what a tremendous bonus, uh, what, what a great fortune for me that my first year on the job here happens to coincide with Santa Anita hosting the Breeders' Cup. Um, but but I, I haven't thought about it very much yet because I'm very focused on the day-to-day. -day and, and But as far as the bigger races, yeah, you do put more um, thought into uh, different angles that are in play with what it would mean um, what, what you might want to try to highlight, uh, should a particular horse win, um, or, but, but then you, you always have to balance that with not wanting to go into a race call actually prepared or rehearsed. You just want mm -hmm. to know, you want to have things swimming around in the back of your head in, in case certain things develop, but, but you just don't know. And, and it's a very big trap to go in too rehearsed expecting a certain, uh, I mean, <laughs> A horse that could be expected to lead might miss the start, and then everything goes out the window. You mentioned about learning to love the game, listening to calls on the radio. How different is it to call a race when there are no pictures versus the role you have now where you're supplementing pictures that everybody is seeing? Yeah, good question. I uh, No doubt in the world that the Australian race calling style developed because of uh, radio. It, it's enormous down there. Um, we, we now, in the last 20 years or so, have an equivalent of uh, a TVG. But um, for decades, it was all radio. And so the, the race calling style was very descriptive. You had to call the races to an audience that you knew couldn't see. And so there was great pressure to to mention every horse, no matter if it was a 20-horse field. Uh, the punters down there are very demanding. If you, if, if you miss a horse, you're in trouble. And, um, <laughs> and, and you really need to, the, the onus is on you to paint a picture. And um, I guess the biggest compliment I could be paid is that if people say to me that they can close their eyes and envisage how the race is unfolding. Um, but that's definitely what uh, what drove the evolution of the Australian style. And um, there are some changes I've made here. I've, I've slowed down a little bit compared to the speed I used to call that in Australia. And I'll throw in a few visual references, mindful that people are able to see the race, referring maybe to a coloured cap or uh, blinkers or shadow roll just to help them pinpoint a certain horse. Um, obviously, that would sound ridiculous if you were calling to a radio audience. So I've, I've changed a little bit in, in the way that I deliver the race calls, but hopefully the descriptive element uh, is largely still in place because I think it's important. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to ask you, uh, do you have any particular races, and thinking back of all the races that you called uh, over the years, is there, is there one that stands out to you as, as 
your favorite or one that you actually have gone back and, and listened to your call uh, maybe more than once on? Uh, it's very hard to pinpoint one. Um, there was a mention earlier of the cigar call at Arlington. That, that was a big moment for me. It was telecast live nationwide on CBS. And um, perhaps the race even took on more uh, significance because Cigar was beaten at his next start at Elmar. But uh, that was when he broke the, or, or tied Citation's record for consecutive wins. And uh, I actually called John Tapp in the week leading up to that. I called him from Chicago and um, asked him for a few pointers. Um, so Great. it was, it was um, and, and one of the things I said near the end of that call was inspired by um, another outstanding Australian race caller who actually influenced uh, Trevor Denman in his formative years, uh, a man called Bill Collins who called in Melbourne. He um, used a line in an epic renewal of the Cox Plate, Australia's Wake for Age Championship, best race in Australia. Melbourne Cup's the most famous race, but the Cox Plate's the best race. And um, at the end of the 86 Cox Plate, Bill Collins said, uh, Bone Crusher races into equine immortality. And I actually tinkered with that. And um, I think I said Cigar assumes the crown of immortality, but it was actually inspired by a Bill Collins race call. So it, it's amazing. That, I mean, that would have been 10 years earlier that that race took place. But, but, but you can still draw on things that, that stick out in your mind from from from, uh, from from famous races of yesteryear and and uh, so I uh, I guess that cigar call is is one of the most special to me that's that's, that's great. great I love the idea of being able to pay that kind of uh, that kind of an homage to, to to someone who influenced you I'm going to ask you a, a, a question you're probably tired of hearing by now, but you mentioned him in the in the previous statement that it popped into mind, and I'm going to go ahead and ask what it's like to replace a legend. Not I guess replace isn't even the right word, but you know to follow a legend like Trevor Denman at the microphone. Does it add any extra pressure to the day to day of your job? Yes, it does. You're mindful of. Um, the legacy that he's created, the enormous fan base over that he's developed over decades, and 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 you know that there has to be people, just naturally, it, it has to be that, that that are are missing him and and still wishing that that he were there. Um, now, in some in some bizarre fashion, maybe despite the audition process that I went through, maybe. <clears throat> Maybe it helped him to create a buffer, a little buffer, because there'd been some months that transpired since Trevor had actually worked there. Um, and as stressful uh, as that protracted audition process was, uh, it, it has crossed my mind that, that maybe a, a blessing in disguise from the standpoint of creating a little buffer. So you're going to have a little break coming up here when they switch to Del Mar in Southern California. Um, what are you going to do with all your free time uh, before the racing uh, goes back to Santa Anita? Not, uh, not a hell of a lot of free time, as a matter of fact. Uh, the, weekend, <laughs> the weekend after Santa Anita closes shortly, I'm tying the knot. And, oh, wow. Um, then, then I still get to call the Santa Rosa Fair. It's the only Northern California fair I've been calling. The dates gel with Santa Anita. So I'll do the three weeks up at the Sonoma County Fair late July into mid-August. And then at the day after that closes, I'm on a plane for Australia. Actually, it was booked last fall under the original itinerary. I'd be there right now. It was going to happen between Golden Gate finishing and Santa Anita uh, and Santa Rosa opening, but uh, for a very good reason, I've had to reschedule. <laughs> I don't mind at all paying a few extra dollars to uh, to the airline to reschedule, given that uh, that I'm busy at Santa Anita right now. But I will be down under uh, for a five-week trip, my first for three years, very excited about it, from mid-August towards the third week of September. So that'll carry me right back towards the start of the fall racing at the Great Race Place. That's great. Well, right. congratulations. 
Uh, oh yeah, congratulations. That is great news. I want to ask you about catchphrases and as a you've got a great one and as a race caller how you how you balance having a catchphrase or certain things you're known for saying with the the, the spontaneity that that goes into your typical way of calling races. Um, like you're, you're referring to saying racing at the start? Racing, yeah, indeed. <laughs> racing. <laughs> well, you know, funnily enough, uh, nobody cares what you say at the start of a race call in Australia, and, and you, you typically just say whatever comes to your mind. And across one race day, you'd probably start a race call four or five different ways, and it's no big deal. And so I didn't know when I came to America in '90 that it's something that was so closely associated with with announcers and that every announcer was known by the specific way, the consistent way he started the race call. And so I I had to decide uh, what I was going to use. And basically it was people at Hollywood Park saying, uh, what what happened in that previous race? You didn't say racing. We like it when you say racing. And <laughs> I, 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 I realized, well, no one else seems to be doing that, so I'll, I'll use racing. But, but it's, it's absolutely not a factor at all in Australia. Um, but, but I've stuck with racing, and, um, and so I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, as far as other colorful quips or uh, cliches that, that I might throw in occasionally, I, I try not to overdo that because I don't want to be branded a comedian. But um, but if you can embellish the race call without jeopardizing the accuracy, which is always paramount, then why not entertain as well as inform? But uh, there are plenty of times when straight after a race, I'll think the line would have worked well in that situation, but it has to come to you in the split second you need it. And the, there are many times when I'm I'm thinking afterwards, I have to remind myself, because I'm actually my biggest critic, uh, I have to remind myself that just because I know how a race call might have been better doesn't mean it was a bad call and that people wouldn't have necessarily disliked the call. But, but I always had this mindset of, of, of how it could have been better. Sometimes the right line comes at the right time, and that's great. I have to jump in with a follow-up about the shared belief return to the races call, which I loved, but you were telling me when we were hanging out the other night in the Eddie Logan suite at Santa Anita that, 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 that some people didn't like it. Tell folks who might not have heard it what the line was that you used in the stretch and, and give a little bit of the, of, the, of the aftermath of that as well, if you don't mind. Right. That was um, a comeback race off a layoff for shared belief at Golden Gate Fields, where of course is, that's where he made his career debut. But but he uh, he resumed off a layoff, and uh, it was the easiest possible win you could envisage. And um, I used the line I said that uh, Bayes looks like a mother with a newborn baby. Um, Which is great, perfect mm -hmm, description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he was he was just cuddling the horse, uh, you know, coming to the sixteenth pole, and um, and 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 was all wrapped up. I mean, so I uh, and and most of the most of the feedback from that was was extremely positive. Unfortunately, there was one person. I, I, I honestly, I honestly can't remember his name, but but he was in the New York press box. Got to be careful of those New York guys, Michael. Those New York guys are trouble. <laughs> oh, and he uh, he ripped me a new one. <laughs> he, 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 what was the criticism? I don't fully a, understand it. Uh, but, but but there's no need to try to be a comedian. Basically, he thought, thought I was trying to have too much fun. Uh, apparently, it, it needs to be deadly serious in every moment. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so. It just goes to show uh, what I've always known, that you can never please all of the people all of the time. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So uh, a phrase like that, or some of the phrases that you say throughout the race, are these ones that you thought about and you think, oh, you know, it might be nice to work that into a race call, or does it just pop into your head and you say, you know, like a mother with a newborn baby is not the sort of thing you'd normally expect to hear in a, in a call of a race? Um, 
where does where does some of that stuff come, or is it just uh, spontaneous much of the time? Well, it, it it really is. It's a bit of both. Uh, most of the stuff that comes out of my mouth is spontaneous. I I don't know what I'm going to say from from one second to the next, but I will say that there are occasionally uh, when when you're calling a horse that you know is. Uh, like, uh, for example, Songbird recently, at the end of her most recent win, I said something that, uh, oh, uh, a pitch-perfect performance. And, and I, I, will admit to, <laughs> I, I will admit to having thought about that beforehand, um, <laughs> thinking, well... A little just, alliteration that, there, that, yeah. Yeah, that might work well, but it might tie in with, you know, her name, and I, I wasn't aware of anybody having written or, or, or said that about her. Maybe I'd missed... I thought that it would probably be a good thing to throw in um, if she won, as most people expected she would. So, you know, there are occasions when when I'll have something ready to throw in, but but that, in all honesty, uh, ninety nine percent of the time that's not the case. The, the the mother with the newborn baby was probably like the pitch perfect performance. I probably had thought, well, if 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 he's winning in that fashion, um, then. I, I don't think I'd ever use that line in a race call. And, uh, so I thought, I'll just file that away, and I'll run with it if I can. I love that idea. It's almost like a horse player envisioning the way a race is going to be run and constructing a bet based on that, except you're doing the same thing with a, with a race call. And, uh, and I think it's, it's why you're able to sort of color in some of those moments in, in, in a way that, that resonates with so many race watchers, certainly uh, us chief among them. I want to ask before you go, Michael, I've got to ask about the Seinfeld thing. How the heck did that come about, and uh, did you have any idea of what you were getting yourself into at the time? It, it certainly was not a case of uh, the Seinfeld producers deciding that they needed a race caller and, and having a little meeting and deciding, we need Michael Rona. Uh, absolutely <laughs> Rest assured, I just happened to be uh, calling the races at the Southern California track that was open at the time. Uh, they, they might well have otherwise used Trevor Denman, but I happened to be calling the races at Hollywood Park, and uh, they contacted Hollywood Park. And uh, so I went to the Burbank studio, even though the the show was set in New York. This was done in uh, a Burbank studio. It was the Subway episode. I think it was their third season. The show was relatively new. And um, so, uh, if, to recap briefly, Kramer over here is a tip <laughs> for a horse while he's riding the Subway, and he bets the horse at an OTB in New York. And the <laughs> horse, whose name, by the way, I still remember, Papanik is the name of the animal. And it was... <laughs> It, it was floundering back in the field, no chance, and Kramer was distraught and dismayed and despaired, and uh, then, of course, he comes with this big late run and wins. And I actually had to redo the call because uh, it was a, the first time I did it was apparently a little too um, realistic. Um, I had the horse gaining ground too gradually, and uh, they wanted it a more... <laughs> they wanted it to be more dramatic, um, you know, from... From, from no chance to here he is and he's going to win. Um, and I had a bit of a throat problem at the time. My, my voice cracked slightly, uh, but, but they, they seemed happy enough with it. Um, and uh, I got to watch Kramer rehearse that scene a few times before he actually filmed it. And if you can believe this, and it's a stretch of the imagination, that he was more out of control, more exaggerated, in the rehearsal, and he actually brought it back a little bit for, for what went to air. I, it, I tell you what, Michael Richards is someone to, to behold uh, when, when he's into those antics. It, it was eye-opening. Well, well, do you remember the punchline of the skit? I have to assume that it wasn't that uh, Kramer gets rich. He must have done something to mess it up. Do you recall? Uh, well, he was looking over his shoulder as he collected because he was nervous about... Uh, and, and then people followed him because he, he collected this wad of cash and, and he was followed out of the um, OTB. And uh, I, I can't remember whether he held under the money or not. But 
But now in Kramer, you would think not. Yeah. <laughs> when you sometimes when you win, you still lose. We all know that as horse players, and I'm sure Kramer uh, not not immune from that uh, dynamic. Uh, Mike Hogan, you have one more for Michael before we uh, let him get on with his day here. I do, I do. I have one more. Um, as somebody who makes a living uh, talking about races and race horses, has there ever been a performance or a horse where you've watched it and you were just left speechless? Uh, well, ho hopefully I'm not left speechless while trying to call a race. But, um, <laughs> um, um, I, I tell you what, that, that move that the holder made in the Pacific Classic, if I were calling that, I don't know, um, I don't know what I would have said. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that, I was watching that in the booth at Golden Gate uh, between races up there, and, um, and I, I was aware of my jaw dropping, literally. Yeah. It was, um, that, that was really special. But um, I, I, can't, uh, I can't think of any one specific uh, example to give you uh, of, of an actual course coming down to the finish line um, where I would have been speechless. Um, I mean, just some of these songbird performances have been awe-inspiring. Um, but you, you've got to keep talking. That's the nature of the job. You've got to keep finding <laughs> things to say. Mm -hmm. It's a little different. I think that in some sports, the, call, the callers, there are opportunities, especially when there are pictures involved, to let the moments speak for themselves, a race caller doesn't have the luxury to, 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 let, to let silence rule. At least I've never seen it. Uh, is that just part of the nature of the gig, like you were saying? Yeah, I think even though I'm not calling on radio anymore, uh, that the obligation is still there to be constantly talking. You, you, you can't take a pause in a race call and... Uh, and have, have somebody, have some engineer somewhere pump up the sound of the crowd cheering and then come back on for the last few strides of the race. It just wouldn't work. It's, it, it is a unique form of sports broadcasting in many ways, and I've never even thought about that angle, but you're spot on. That, 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 that's another thing that, that really distinguishes race calling from, from any other kind of sports play-by-play. -play. Uh, you, you, you cannot take a second off. The whole stress with race calling is that there is no take two. Uh, you've got to live with your split second responses to what you see. It's not like you're on a movie set, like Kramer, for example, uh, where, where you can retake something a dozen times. You've got to live with your split second responses, and uh, and you're mindful of how much money is being invested. You don't want to lead people astray. You don't want to misinform. Even even a different inflection in your voice can raise or lower people's hopes of how their horse is traveling. And um, so I, I take the job very seriously, even though I also try to enjoy it as much as I can and make it colorful and fun. I think you do a great job of expressing that fun. You make a lot of great points about the, the art of broadcasting. And uh, I, I hope you'll agree to come back on the show sometime soon. We'll talk a little bit more about racing and, uh, and the art of race calling, if you're up for it. Oh, it would be my absolute pleasure. Thanks for spending some time with me. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Michael. All right. So that's it. That's about all the time we have on the show today. I think, Mike Hogan, you had another point or two you wanted to make about last weekend's races, but maybe we'll just roll those back for Friday if you're good for that. Um, no problem. I want to thank Mike Hogan. I want to thank Charlie Zeggers. I want to thank Jonathan Kinchin. I want to thank Michael Rona. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this edition of the DRF Players Podcast. We'll be back in a couple of days to talk about the weekend slate of races. May you win all your photos. Your photos. Your photos. Your photos. Your photos. Your photos. Your photos.